A prominent Australian politician who after the First World War had ambitions to become the country's Prime Minister, is accused of what the British press described as the chalk pit murder in Surrey in 1946. Aside from facing the rope, he had acquired over the years a dubious reputation as a dishonest businessman, black marketeer, gambling promoter, blatant political hypocrite, adulterer, and possibly a serial killer. Thomas Leigh was born in the West Country city of Bath on the 28th of October 1880 to Henry and Elizabeth. Two years after his birth, his father, who had the occupation of a butler, died in the local hospital and his widow with her mother decided in 1886 to emigrate with her four children to Australia. They settled in Sydney, where she opened a grocery store and a boarding house. Leigh attended Crown Street Public School, but left at the age of 10 to help out with his mother's grocery shop. He did various different jobs, but two stand out. Working a newspaper round, he became aware that the mansions were owned by wealthy politicians and lawyers. He became friendly with a judge, which eventually enabled him to enter the legal profession. He also worked on a dairy farm in Windsor, which in those days was a small town 50 miles away from Sydney. By lantern light, he taught himself shorthand and would transcribe lengthy political speeches printed in the Sydney newspapers. He joined a solicitor's practice in Pitt Street as a junior clerk and stenographer, and in 1901 he joined the firm of Norton Smith & Co. and started his steady climb up the legal profession. By 1906 he was an article clerk and qualified as a solicitor in 1914. He married Emily Vernon in 1898, and both were active in politics, and his wife particularly in the international suffrage movement, and they moved into an in-laws house in Glebe, and Lay started to climb the political ladder from city to state, and later to federal government. During this time, he also joined the Sydney Mechanical School of Arts, where he developed his skills as a debater. He later put this to good use. Part of his political rise was to join the Presbyterian Debating Society, and allied himself with the Protestant section of Sydney society. After he had qualified as a solicitor, he moved his family south to Hertzville, where he successfully won an election for the local council as an alderman. Those years reading political speeches were not in vain, as he advanced up the greasy pole of politics. After failing to become Hertzville's mayor, he turned his attention to state affairs and finally federal politics. He allied himself with the growing temperance movement as a declared teetotaler and even acquired the nickname Lemonade Lay by his political opponents. He did, however, anchor the temperance movement by promoting legislation favourable to brewers. It was claimed at the time that he was taking bribes of £3,000, which later turned out to be true. He won an election by calling for an immediate referendum on banning alcohol. The Labour press alleged that he had a bottle of red wine every day at lunch. After the election, he said that the referendum would in fact take place in five years' time. From 1922 till 1925, He acted as Minister of Justice for New South Wales, responsible for commuting hanging to life imprisonment and pardoning convicts, even though he was noted for his harshness. In one notorious case, a music teacher called Edward Williams was living with his three daughters in a one-bedroom flat in the Paddington area of Sydney. His wife was currently in a lunatic asylum, and one of the daughters was showing similar traits. He did not want them to go into state care, 
as they could end up becoming prostitutes. As Paddington was, at the time, an overcrowded slum with the usual social problems, one can understand his concern. One of his children said that she really wanted to go to heaven, and Williams obliged by slitting their throats after midnight on the 2nd of February 1923. Despite repeated calls by various groups, including the Labour Party and the Prison Reform Group for Clemency, he was hanged at Long Ray Prison on the 27th of March 1924. Lay's attitude could be described as a moral conservative, and he explained his position as that it is murder and there are no circumstances in which it can be justified. But he started to show a relaxed attitude to the administration of justice. In another earlier case in May 1923, an English immigrant called Leonard Puddyford raped and killed a five-year-old boy. Despite this awful event, he went down for manslaughter and was given just three years by the judge. Lay promised the outraged public that he would arrange legislation to overcome this light sentence. But he had another agenda. He kept his seat at the election, but his party lost. He arranged for Puddyford to be secretly released early and deported. His plan was to embarrass the opposition, who would have to explain this dubious event. However, a dock strike prevented the ship leaving, and the next minister brought Puddyford back to jail. But it was in other areas that he was acquiring a very dubious reputation, both in politics and in business. Let us start with politics. Lay's rivals had a habit of dying or just disappearing in unusual circumstances. He turned his attention to federal politics and contested the seat of Barton. As a former New South Wales Minister of Justice, he assumed he would not linger on the back benches for long, but acquire a federal ministerial appointment. But it was not to be. His opponent was Frederick MacDonald of the Labour Party. Four days before the election, MacDonald made an explosive allegation. He claimed that Lay had offered him a bribe of 2,000 shares in an apartment development in the King's Cross area of Sydney if he would withdraw from the race. Lay responded by issuing a writ for slander through his solicitor for £15,000. MacDonald soon realised that he could be ruined if he lost and withdrew his accusation. Lay won his seat comfortably and believed that he would be offered some kind of ministerial position as a consequence. But after the election, MacDonald regretted his decision and issued a writ of petition to the Court of Disputed Returns. Lay faced ruin if the Court ruled against him. On the 2nd of April 1926, MacDonald met his wife for lunch at a restaurant in Castle Ray Street. They had much to celebrate, as he had just returned from a successful property deal in Tasmania, and he was due to meet the New South Wales Premier to discuss a position in the Department of Education. At 2.40pm, they left the restaurant and agreed to meet again at 6pm. He was never seen again. The writ collapsed, as the main witness never turned up. It is very difficult to judge politicians of yesteryear from a modern perspective. Attitudes to morality, religion, immigration and capital punishment change over time. The most famous is the abolition of slavery by the British Empire in 1834. Whilst the slaves across the British Empire were being freed, the toll martyrs were being deported and shipped at government expense to Australia. Lay was certainly loathed by a section of his party, but a bigwig in state politics would certainly expect some kind of national ministerial position. Australia's then Prime Minister, Stanley Bruce, 
knew MacDonald and thought him a decent human being. Lay never got that appointment and languished on the back benches until he lost his seat in 1928. But other strange things were happening in Lay's world. Aside from being actively involved in politics, he dabbled in business. One of his ventures had the rather interesting title of Prickly Pear Poison Limited. If the poison worked, it was an excellent idea, as prickly pear trees hindered the development of agriculture and property developments. Initially, it looked good, but it had two obvious drawbacks. No patents and creative accounting. That is fraud. The day after giving good news to investors, Lay sold 4,400 shares out of a total of 5,000, held for the equivalent in today's money of 750,000 Australian dollars, and he and his then mistress went on a six-month holiday to Europe. But he had made a fatal mistake. Blatant political hypocrisy, wastage of public funds, rank administrative incompetence, naked nepotism or stealing from the public is not a serious offence to any self-respecting politician. But not to your fellow peers. You basically do not rob your friends. One such was a fellow state representative called Harvey Goldstein, who had invested in the company. He started to make pertinent inquiries, and later he was found at the bottom of Coogee Cliffs, also called Suicide Point. He left no suicide note. Goldstein was nearly as blind as a bat without his glasses, but none were ever recovered. Lay's business partner, Harry Andrews, resigned from the law practice and represented dissatisfied shareholders. A group of businessmen appointed a former colleague called Keith Greedor to investigate the affairs of the Prickly Pear Poison Company. On a boat trip, he fell overboard and drowned. As Minister of Justice for New South Wales, part of Lay's duties were to travel, and he went to Western Australia, where he became infatuated with a married woman called Maggie Brooks. Her husband soon died, reportedly of bee stings. Lay brought her back to Sydney, and installed her as his mistress near the State Parliament for the next 25 years. In 1928, he lost the Barton seat and was now a washed-up politician, broke due to suffering costs relating to the demise of the Prickly Pear Poison Company. He emigrated back to Britain by taking his mistress with him, who got him back on his feet by purchasing some properties for him. His long-suffering wife also joined him in 1942 presumably to avoid the perceived invasion of Australia by the Japanese. Not much is known about his activities back in England, but they do seem rather dubious. He tried to organise a £1 million sweepstake on the Derby. Bookmaking in those days could only occur at racetracks. Sweepstakes, except in formal ones in offices, were illegal. In this instance, nobody got their money back. It all went to lay. He was certainly involved in property, but on one occasion he and his son had to pay out £20,000 in damages to avoid prison for reasons that are not clear. During the war he was involved in black market activities, for which he was convicted. Just after the war, his mistress Maggie Brooks was living at the Wygate Hill Hotel in Wimbledon whilst Lay was converting some flats at five Beaufort Gardens. One of the employees at the hotel was a barman called John Moody. Apart from exchanging pleasantries on the stairs, they hardly knew each other. But Lay was suffering mental delusions, and his state of paranoia believed that Moody and Brooks were actually former lovers, and he was now blackmailing her. Brooks was now 66 years old, and Moody was 30 years her junior. Lay contacted two builders he knew. John Smith, a joiner foreman, 
who worked on the flats at Beaufort Gardens, and later a John Buckingham. They were to kidnap Moody, who had signed a confession to blackmail, and be persuaded with £500 to leave the country. But Buckingham was not told all of the real story. Lay's paranoia meant he wanted Moody dead. John Smith understood the real motive, and was seen digging a hole in a chalk pit at Waldingham Common in Surrey, the day before the murder. At first Buckingham suggested a plan, whereby he would appear drunk at the hotel, and Moody, as the barman, would try to throw him out, and unfortunately would be kidnapped. This was a ballon for a more subtle scheme. For this to work, Buckingham recruited his son, and a friend called Lillian Bruce. She was supposed as a wealthy woman at the hotel, and tried to engage in conversation with Moody. She succeeded, and asked him if he would work as a barman at a private party. On the night in question, he was picked up in a Woolsey, driven by Buckingham Jr., who pretended to be a chauffeur and taken to Lay's home. He was promptly tied up, and the Buckinghams and their friend left him alone in the property. There was not one witness to the actual murder. If anyone engages in criminal behaviour, which results in a killing, even if they do not commit the act, they could still be liable to be hanged. Moody was strangled to death, either by Smith or Lay, and Smith then sloppily disposed of the body in the chalk pit. On the evening of the 29th of November 1946, Walter Coombs was returning from work when he thought he saw what he thought was a heap of rags. On closer inspection, it was the body of a man. He called his father, who visited the chalk pit, but neither interfered with the body. They visited Surrey Police Station at Oxted and returned with P.C. Hearns. Moody's dead body had a rope around it, tied with a half-hitched knot. The soles of his feet were not covered in dirt, which showed that he had been brought there from somewhere else. A few days earlier, two market gardeners, Clifford and Frederick Smith, were cycling past the chalk pit, where they saw a man who hastily got into his car and rapidly drove away in a dark saloon on seeing them. They could not remember the make of the car as it was dusk, but agreed it was a dark colour. Smith had hired a dark coloured Ford earlier in the week. The three main protagonists were Lay, his henchman Smith and Buckingham Senior. Buckingham Junior and Bruce only played a minor part. On the fateful night, the Buckinghams and Bruce had picked up the unfortunate Moody from the hotel in the Woolsey, while Smith travelled behind in the hired car. The younger Buckingham acted as Bruce's chauffeur. When the car stopped, this gave the opportunity for Smith to get into the car and with Buckingham's help, overpower the hapless Moody. Buckingham Jr. and Bruce left for a well-earned drink at the nearby Crown and Scepter pub. They were joined later by Buckingham Sr., for a night's pub crawl, but not Smith. After two weeks, the police were getting nowhere and appealed to the public for help. The problem for them was that there appeared to be no motive. Moody was just a simple barman and had not done something bad in the war or was mixed up with the underworld. Buckingham Sr., who was a particularly unsavoury character, was arrested, and during subsequent interrogation, turned King's evidence. So what was the actual relationship, if any, between Jack Moody and Mrs. Brooks? She was visiting a friend called Mrs. Evans, who occasionally had visits from a former lodger, who was Moody. Mrs. Evans introduced them, and that, as it happens, was the only time they had formally met. 
Lay had previously been certainly acting suspiciously. He had called at the Woburn Place Hotel, where his estranged wife stayed. He contacted the head porter called Minden and asked if he knew of a man who could look after himself and keep his mouth shut. Minden was given £10 notes for his information. He knew Buckingham, who drove for hotel customers. Lay met with Buckingham and explained that Moody had seduced a mother and daughter and was blackmailing them. Mention should be made of a witness called Cruikshank who lived in Bern in Switzerland. It appears that he was some kind of smuggler. He claimed that he went to Beaufort Gardens, as Lay was a rich man and could help a fellow Australian to get back home. He banged on the front door to no avail and decided to go to the back door. On entering it, he used the light from his cigarette lighter to survey the room. He saw a person gagged and tied to a chair so promptly left. As an ex-convict, the testimony was not believed by the court, who thought he was trying to gain publicity. Lay and Smith were apprehended, charged and tried for the murder at the Old Bailey. Despite pleading their innocence, the evidence against Lay and Smith was overwhelming, especially when it came to the money trail. The jury deliberated for just under an hour and subsequently found both guilty. Lay maintained he was an innocent party to the end. His solicitor wanted him to use the rules whereby he pleaded guilty but insane. But Lay decided to go down fighting and claimed that he had never met Moody and had no other dealings with him. His speech to the judge showed the old politician had not lost his touch, stating that he was not surprised at the verdict after the judge's bias summing up at the exploitation of allegations of jealousy, suspicion and motive, and with such-like nonsense. He stated that the judge refused to allow him to tell what he wanted to say. He had said it from the beginning, and said it now and felt it was totally unwarranted. Lord Goddard, the presiding judge, had no alternative but to impose the death penalty. John Smith subsequently was given a reprieve from the noose and sentenced to life in prison, three days before he was due to be hanged on the 8th of May 1947. Two doctors pronounced that Lay was suffering from acute paranoia and was completely insane. He was incarcerated for life in Broadmoor Hospital for the criminally insane. He is reputed at the time to have been the richest person in that institution. On the 8th of May 1947, Lay suffered a massive stroke and died. He left an estate in New South Wales, valued for probate of £744. His widow had followed him to England in 1942, and after his death, subsequently returned to Australia. She died in New South Wales in 1956. The story of Lay is one of two parts. Australia, where he was for a time a very successful politician. The second part is his role in the murder of an innocent man. In Australia, there had been calls to remove his portrait from the New South Wales Parliament. This has been rejected, as it will interfere with history. He was a fraudster in both the UK and Australia, and certainly a killer. History shows us that the names change, but human behaviour is constant. <laughs>